Man, I, I love this project, and I just want to say to our church, I love you, and I love the heart that you have for missions. I mean, in the same morning, we're talking about what we were able to accomplish in Haiti and uh, just the small part that we were to play there. But here in the Philippines, I was thinking this morning of James 1.27. You all know that verse. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And we get to have a part in the lives of some of these fatherless children, these orphans. I was thinking again this, this morning, it, it really gets to my heart when I, when I stop and I break this project down. Could you imagine being 18 years old and just having nowhere to go and having no support system and just you've aged out of the orphanage and then you're just turned out into the world and there's nobody there to fall back on? That would literally set up just probably disaster is where that's going to end up going. And then I was thinking about the project. I love what they named their house, the Heritage House. Did you all pick up on what that name Heritage means? Go ahead. What is it? Help me out this morning. An inheritance. What their families cannot give them, God is more than able to give them. And as a church, we get to play a part in that. And so I love it. For $100,000, I was thinking about that this morning too. $100,000 is a lot of money, but $100,000 doesn't go very far in America anymore. Can I get a big amen to that? <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of people nodding their heads. But in the Philippines, we're able to help them complete that project and be able to build that independent living facility. And so with that $100,000, these kids that are 18 years old will have their own apartments. They'll be able to have their own individual living spaces. But not only that, they'll have a job. They're going to have that bakery so that it provides them with a source of income, a way of making some money and providing for themselves so they can continue to be grounded in biblical principles and become everything that God wants them to be. And so what an awesome part that we as a church are going to get to play in this project. And uh, I just get excited about I think about where our church is at and some of the things that we pray for. And I know the Gormleys and already what they have accomplished in the Philippines is incredible. But I also know that this was a huge, gigantic step of faith for them to begin the orphanage, to start a school, and now to take care of these kids as they go into their next phase of life. They have been praying and begging and seeking God for some answers of how he's going to provide. And guess what? On the other side of the world, thousands of miles away, God's working through West Florida Baptist Church and in your hearts and in your lives. And we have the ability and the means to be able to answer, be an answer to their prayers and for that work to go on and go forward. And so... $215,000. That's our overall goal for missions this year. That is our biggest goal ever for missions. But with man, no, why did I say with man? <laughs> with God, all things are possible. With man, it feels impossible sometimes, but with God, all things are possible. Let me just give you a couple numbers um, that I think will help you to be able to understand how we can get this job done this year, okay? So the first number is this, $2,150, okay? $2,150. If 100 people would give $2,150, we would be able to reach that goal of $215,000. And I'll tell you, my wife and I are going to take two of those slots right there. So we only need 98 more people that can step up and give $2,150 and we'll be able to get that job done. Here's another number. All right, you ready for the second number? Here it is. $58 a month. $58 a month. I found out this week that currently our church is made up of 312 families. And if you take 312 families and each one of those families gave $58 a month, we would be able to raise the $215,000 that we need to be able to support missions all around the world. And when you break it down like that, it doesn't feel quite as big and quite as impossible any longer. And the only reason why I mention those numbers is just to simply get your brain stern and just to ask you to go before God and to pray about what he would have you to give. Because quite frankly, all God expects us to do is our part, and that's all we ask you to do is just get with God, find out what he would have you to give above and beyond your tithe and your offering, and then whatever he lays on your heart, step out by faith and give it and watch God be able to provide for us, but more importantly, watch God be able to provide for you and for you to be able to see the incredible things that he wants to do in and through you and in and through our church. And so on September 22nd, okay, that's four weeks from today, 
We're going to take up an offering. You can just give a lump sum and take care of your um, whatever God lays on your heart that day. Or we're also going to take up commitments that day. We have all the way till next August to raise that $100,000. So you can make a commitment and then you can give that monthly, weekly, however you want to over the course of this upcoming year. But whatever that is, be praying about it. We'll talk a little bit more about this project, but that is going to be on September 22nd. Are you excited about the part that we get to play in missions? How many of you are really, really tired this morning? I'm just looking out at your faces, and I see some tired people, and I know I'm feeling it this morning, too. We had an awesome 5K yesterday. It is packed in here, but I'm excited about um, our new book that we're going to be studying. Are y'all ready for a new book? Anybody curious where we're going this morning? We wrapped up Romans last week. We've been going through that for a year, and this morning, we're going to start a study going through the book of... Man, you all are so good. It's right up there on the screen. We're going through the book of Joel. So if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Joel. I'll give you about two minutes or so to find it. It is about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. It's tucked all the way at the end of the Old Testament, mixed in with 12 other men known as the Minor Prophets. What makes them the minor prophets? It's because they're not the hall of famers like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. No, that has nothing to do with it. They're only minor in the sense of their books are a whole lot smaller than those other four books that I just mentioned to you. Okay, so about two thirds of the way through the Bible, you will find the book of Joel. Somebody asked me the question, why the book of Joel? Well, you know what our our current sermon series is? It's Believe, Belong, Become. And then through the book of Joel, I'm going to add this little tagline to it. The day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. I believe with where we're at as a church, with some of the vision that we laid out last week about adding a third service and about building a new auditorium, and then even with goals like $215,000 for missions, why Why are we going to continue to push forward? Why are we going to continue to take big steps of faith? Why not just sit back and be comfortable with what God's given to us? Can I tell you this morning that the day of the Lord is at hand? And in the book of Joel, he uses three different events to help us understand how significant this is and how important it is to our everyday life. In chapter one, what we're going to look at today, he uses an immediate crisis, a natural disaster. Okay, so we're going to talk about that this morning. And then in chapter two, he talks about an imminent invasion, a threat from a foreign enemy that can come in and take in the land. And then at the end of chapter two and into chapter three, he talks about the ultimate day of the Lord, where one day the Lord is going to return and he's going to judge this world, and it should sound ominous, and it should light a fire under us, but as believers too, that is a hopeful day that we are looking forward to with expectancy, because when he judges this world, he's going to judge it of all of its sin, all of its problems, all of its turmoil. He's going to make every wrong right, and he's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth where we're going to be able to worship God forever, and what an awesome day that that's truly going to be. So that's where we're going to be going here through the book of Joel. Now, I want you to understand that Joel is a prophet of God. How many of you are a little bit intimidated by the prophets? Anybody here intimidated by the prophets? No one's raising their hands. Okay. So y'all, okay. Anybody like when you need to pick me up, you just are like, man, I need something to get me going. I'm going to go to one of the prophets. It's not typically what we do either. We don't, we go to Psalms or somewhere like that often if we need a little bit of a pick me up. I, I believe that when you think of the prophets, a lot of you instantly in your mind, you start thinking about prophecy. You start thinking about future events. So let me ask you this. Who loves prophecy? Okay, there's some in here that love prophecy. Who gets a little bit nervous about prophecy and says, where in the world is all of this going to go? Anybody like that? All right, so we've got a lot of different mixed emotions in here, I'm sure, as we go through all of this. But what I want you to understand, while it is true that the prophets absolutely do foretell, They are inspired by God. They tell about future events that are going to happen and they are going to take place. While they do foretell, they also foretell. They speak truth to God's people right where they are at. All right, so if you're in Joel chapter one, I want everybody to look at verse one with me and I want you to help me by reading this verse out loud, okay? Can you all do that this morning? Everybody help me out with Joel chapter one, verse one. Here we go. Out loud, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. That's about all that we know about Joel. We don't know much about him as a person. We don't know much about his father, 
Pethuel. I don't even know if that's how you say his name correctly. It's probably not. And we also don't even know much about the period of history when he actually was alive and when he was writing this book. There is a whole lot of speculation and debate that he was alive around the time of Elijah and Elisha, around like the 800 BC mark. But then there's a whole lot of other people that think he came at the very end um, of the Old Testament, around 400 BC, after the Babylonian captivity. And I read a lot about that, and I'm going to just save you all the time and just tell you that nobody really truly knows at what period of history he was alive. Is that a problem? And I'm going to say absolutely not, because in verse 1, we know everything that we need to know about Joel. It says that the word of the Lord came to Joel. He was commissioned by God. He was given a word by God for these people that is still applicable to us today where we are at. And that brings me to the title of my message this morning, which is this, Crisis Control. Crisis Control. Chapter 1 is a natural disaster. It is a current crisis. And in chapter 1, verse 17, you're going to see the statement, the day of the Lord is at hand. And can I tell you that the day of the Lord is a warning cry. It is an opportunity to repent. It's an opportunity to ultimately be spared from the wrath of God, which is to come. And so this is very applicable to all of us here today. And there are some great truths and some great life lessons that we're going to learn here in chapter one. So are you all ready to dive right in? I'm not going to dive in until I'm convinced that you all are. You all ready to dive right in this morning? Okay. All right, good. So let's look at it. The first thing that I want us to see this morning is this. Elders and citizens here. All right. The main word here is here. Elders and citizens here. Look at verse two. He says this. Hear this, ye old men. And give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your father? Here, Joel is speaking to two different groups of people. And he starts with the old men. He starts with the elders. And he says, have you ever seen anything like this before in your lives? Did you ever hear your parents talk about anything like this before in your lives? And the answer is no. And then he turns it to all the inhabitants and he says, hey, listen, if your elders, if the older people in the land have never heard about this and if their parents have never heard or seen anything like this, guess what? You've never seen or heard anything like this either before. This is something monumental that's going on. Look what he says in verse three. He says, tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What we have going on here is a natural disaster or national emergency, something along the lines of like a Pearl Harbor type event or a 9-11 type event. How many of you, like those are the things that get passed down from generation to generation to generation because they're monumental events in life and in history that are not quickly forgotten, okay? So we have a disaster and we have a crisis like that that's going on and taking place. Well, is anybody wondering, well, what in the world is it? What is the crisis? Look at verse four. He says, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. The land of Judah, the land of Israel just experienced, I'm going to call it the great locust invasion. That's what it was right there. The national disaster that they were faced with was the great locust invasion. And those four different animals, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, they are four different types of species that were just mentioned. Okay, so you want to, you want to learn a little bit about some of these locusts in the Bible times. All right, the palmer worm. In Hebrew, that word has, to do, has the idea of cutting or shearing, okay? So this locust was capable of some incredible devastation. Whatever vegetation was in the land, these guys just come and cut it and shear it, man. They just are devouring it. Then you have the word locust, and that word means swarming in Hebrew, okay? So it probably is talking about the ability that it has to multiply rapidly. So round one, you have these cutting and shearing locusts that come in. Round two, you have these swarming locusts, and they just are able to multiply rapidly, and they're just eating and devouring. Then you got round number three. You got the canker worm. And you know what that word means? It means to leap or hop, and it describes how it eats. It leaps and hops from one branch and from one leaf to another leaf. So this is round three. And now you have a fourth wave of this locust invasion, and it's the caterpillar. And you think of those caterpillars as those tiny little furry guys that are harmless and can do no good. But this is a locust that we're talking about here, and it means destroyer or finisher. 
So the fourth wave of this great invasion was this type of locust, and he came in and he finished the job, and when it was all said and done, the land was completely devastated. We're going to see at the end of the chapter, there is, there's nothing left. I mean, all the trees, gone. I mean, the land is barren. It was like a drought and a fire had come in and taken over the land, and there was 100% complete devastation. So here is the first practical application that I want to talk about this morning. When you find yourself in a crisis, be real. Be real. God's crying out to the people. He sends his prophet and he says, hear, listen, give ear, pay attention. God is trying to speak to you in the midst of this incredible devastation. Have you ever realized, well, let me say this first. You understand that natural disasters, calamity, difficult times that we go through in our life, different crises, death, that they are all a megaphone from God to get our attention. This is where it's applicable and practical to us even today. Have you ever realized and noticed how soft people are towards God often after disaster? One of the things that I will never forget about 9-11, one of the incredible, the positive things that resulted from that was, you remember the unity that just swept through our country after that? Remember the flags that were everywhere and people that were proud to be Americans and all of a sudden politics and things like that didn't matter anymore and there was a sense of unity. But even greater than that sense of unity, I remember how soft people's hearts were towards God. And I remember national leaders and every time you turned on the news and on the media, people were praying and people were talking about God and he was back in the conversation and he was back in the dialogue because often when something huge and monumental like that happens, that puts us back on our faces, that puts us in a place where we recognize what is actually real and taking place, we know exactly where we need to turn. Just this past Monday night, um, Joe Ash was in our house. We were catching up with him from this summer, and we had a great conversation. We were talking about his brother Jaden that had passed away, and he was just sharing some of the different things and talking about even being real as Christians and where we're supposed to be when, when we find ourselves in difficult situations. He said one of the things that he'll never forget and that he learned from that is when that happened instantly, there was a peace and a sense of knowing that something bigger was taking place, that God was ultimately in control. And that there wasn't necessarily questioning of God and what was going on, but there was just an ability in that moment to be able to have a peace and be able to handle it, even in the midst of intense grief. And of course, there's been so much grief down through. I'm not saying that that was an easy situation at all, but there was an instant realization that God was in control, that God knows best, that God knows what he's doing, and the peace that comes along as a result of that. I know when we find ourselves in these crisis moments and in these intense situations. People get mad at God sometimes. People get angry at God. People question God. People start saying, if God's really a God of love, how in the world could he do something like this? Can I tell you that God could have completely removed himself from this world? We sinned. We sinned against God. He told us exactly what would happen if we sinned, and and we are sinners. And he could completely remove himself from this world. He could let the curse of sin take completely over, but he did not do that. And even here in the midst of this tragedy, he is calling out to us in our pain. When you find yourself with your back up against the wall in a horrible situation, one that you never anticipated or the ones that you dread in life, can I tell you that God is there? And he's saying, here, Listen, pay attention. I'm calling out to you in my pain. So we have to be real about what's happening and what's taking place. Secondly, the thing I want us to see this morning is that he calls the drunkards to awake. So he says the elders and citizens here. And then the second thing he does is he says drunkards awake. Look at verse 5. He says right there, awake ye drunkards and weep. And how all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth. Can I tell you that the the locust devastation was so great and so terrible that the alcohol was completely removed from the land because they had absolutely no way of making it. There was a forced detox that was taking place, and so he's calling out and he's saying, drunkards, awake. Now look at verses six and seven. He says this, for a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. 
He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. How many of you think you're going to think about and look at locusts a little bit differently? I mean, he's talking about the teeth of a lion and the jawbones. I mean, you, who's a little bit scared of locusts now? I'm a little bit worried. The next time I see a locust, I'm going to be like, watch out for that thing, man. Those teeth are massive. We don't think about those things like that. When I, when I was thinking of this passage, do you understand that God doesn't have to send great armies to bring us to our knees? He can do it with a swarm of insects. You want to try to wrap your mind around how great our God is. We, we sung about how holy our God is, how unlike anything that we can fully understand or we can fully wrap our minds around. God is a holy God, and he doesn't have to send great armies. All he needs is a swarm of little insects to get the job done. Why call out the drunkard? I think that's a, a big question that needs to be asked here. He says, awake drunkards. This is like really the only, not the specific group of people, but maybe the specific sin that's mentioned throughout the book of Joel. Perhaps, and I thought this was probably the best uh, the best definition given for this, perhaps they represent all the careless people who only live for pleasure. How many of you agree there's a lot of just careless people in this world that just live simply for our pleasure? Whatever feels good, let's do it. Let's make the most out of our lives. This is a group of people that were lulled to sleep by living for the moment and they lost sight of reality. Man, it's so easy for us to get lulled to sleep and lose sight of reality. Here's the practical application that I want from this point here. Be sober. Be sober. Yesterday was our Coming Clean 5K, and when we had it to raise awareness for addiction recovery, and can I tell you, our church showed up in a big way yesterday. Yesterday was awesome. Those are some of my favorite days where we corporately served together as a church. We had our biggest turnout ever in the city of Milton. There was an awesome vibe down there yesterday. I know that the word was able to get out, that there's people at West Florida Baptist Church that love and care for other people, and I am so thankful for all of you. How many of you helped out and played a part in yesterday? How many of you ran and that's why you're tired and exhausted? Where are my people that were like barely slept? That We had a group of guys camp out there because they had to set up all of that equipment for um, the music team that was there. And uh, man, there's just some incredible servants here that made a day like that possible yesterday. And I absolutely love it. But what I love even more is that we have a group of people that are dedicated to being here every single Friday night at our Coming Clean Recovery Program. And I was thinking this morning just about how good Satan is. He's such an incredible liar. You know that nobody ever drinks alcohol thinking that they're going to become an alcoholic? You know that nobody ever messes around with drugs thinking that they're going to become addicted to drugs? Nobody does that. They just think, oh, this is going to be a good time. But Satan is good and he's powerful. And there's, there's things chemically that can even happen inside of our brains. And before long, sometimes we can get fully addicted. And I got to tell you this morning, my heart breaks for those who struggle with addiction. Because of our ministry and because of what we have Friday night, I've been able to be around them, a lot of them. And you know what? They, they don't want that disease. They don't want to struggle with that anymore. They, they want to be changed and they want to be different. But sometimes it feels absolutely impossible and it feels so great. And I'm thankful for people in our church that are there that say, hey, we love you and we care about you. But greater than that, God loves you and he cares about you. And here's a helping hand. And with God's help and with our help, you can do it because there is power in the name of Jesus, transforming power. He can break those chains. He can set you free. He can give you a new life and a new walk. And I'm thankful for the people. And can I tell you, if you're struggling with addiction, we love you and we care about you and God loves you and we want to help you in any way that we possibly can. But this message here, and I'll tell you, you know the people that would be shouting this the loudest and clearest? Those who struggle with addiction, they would stand up and say, be sober. Listen. Listen to what God's word's saying right here. Hey, to, to those who get drunk but may not necessarily be drunkards, be sober. To God's people, don't live for the pleasures of this world. Satan is good. And we weren't created for this life. And we weren't created for the pleasures of this world. We were created to live for the honor and glory of God, to point people to him. And God knows that there is no lasting satisfaction in anything that this world has to offer. Yes, there is pleasure in sin, but it's for a season. And if we get consumed with our jobs and our lives and our monies and the weekends and one good time after another good time, we're going to wake up one day and we might be exactly where these people are at where not only is the alcohol gone, 
but your family's gone, your home is gone, every good gift that God's ever given you is gone. There's a message that's speaking loud and clear. We gotta, we gotta be sober. There is a greater reality. Eternity is real. And we can't play around with this. And then the next group of people he goes to are the farmers and those that, that run the vineyards. And he says, farmers lament. Look at verse 8. Verses 8 through 12, he's talking specifically to the farmers here. And he says in verse 8, he says, Lament like a virgin, gird it with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Grieve like a young girl whose fiancé has just died. Man, all the hopes and dreams of the future and the excitement and the fiancé all of a sudden passes away. That, that's what he's saying to do here. The intense grief that comes along with that. And I'm not going to read all the rest of the verses, 9 through 12, but I'm just going to tell you, he goes on and he says, the field is wasted, the land mourneth, and then he describes, he says, the corn, the wheat, the barley, they're all destroyed, along with the new wine and the oil. The vine is dried up, so is the fig, the pomegranate, the palm, and the apple trees. And then look at verse 11, and look how it starts. I need you all to help me out with those first three words. What's he say there at the first three words? Everybody out loud together. He says, be ye ashamed. Be ye ashamed. You know what he's talking about there? Be humiliated. And he, he wants to get them to the point where they recognize, you have no hope in the earth. Look at farmers. Th those of you that took care of all those vineyards, you had so much pride in your land and in your crops and all the beauty of it and the way that it supplies. But all of that is gone. There's nothing left. And can I tell you, wherever you look in this world, you have no hope in this earth. That land is scorched. That land is dried up. The storehouses and the barns are empty. Man, there's a famine that's about to be coming across this land that is going to be unlike anything that you've ever experienced before. And get ashamed and get humbled and recognize the fact that in this earth, in this world, there is no hope. And here's the practical application. Be submitted. Be submitted. Remember, Joel is declaring the word of the Lord to Israel. And in the previous verses, to the drunkards, God declared. And if you go back and you look at verses 6 and 7 again, you will see that God declared that it was my land, my vine, my fig tree. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God has a right to do with his land and his creation whatever he wants to do with it. Some people just have a hard time with that. I got to admit, sometimes I even cringe at that because of my own selfishness and my own nature that sometimes gets in the way. But God has every right to do with his creation and his creatures whatever he wants to do with it. And here's the reality. Sometimes God has to strip us of all of our pride to bring us to the point where we actually see that we have no hope in the earth. Sometimes he's got to do it. Sometimes he's got to humble us. Now, you got to understand, what's happening here in the book of Joel was happening to the nation of Israel. And all of it was preventable. This was God's people. There's not a nation on earth today like the nation of Israel. There is the nation of Israel, but it's different than even it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was God's vehicle that he used to show the world who God was. And so they were literally a land and a nation that was supposed to be governed by God as the head of that nation. And God said, hey, if you obey me and all my principles, I will bless you. And if you don't, I'm going to send cursings. God warned them. He told them exactly what would happen. And when they were disobedient to God, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. This should not have taken them by surprise. It was all completely preventable. But here's what I want you to see. Don't miss God's mercy. Don't miss God's mercy. Israel is here because one truth after another truth and one warning after another warning and one message after another message of saying, give your life to God, obey him, keep his commandments. There's no better life than the one that's lived for God. Man, that message was being shouted out, but they kept rejecting it and they kept ignoring it and they kept living for themselves and they kept living for the pleasures of this world. And one day they woke up and they recognized I have no hope on this earth. I got nowhere else to turn. There's only one place I can look to, and it's to heaven, and it's to God. And can I tell you the good news? Even when God is our last option, he's still an option because that's who our God is. 
He's merciful, and it doesn't matter how many times you've rejected him. It doesn't matter how far you've run. It doesn't matter how angry or how mad you have been. At some point, humble yourself and be submitted and say, okay, God, I got no other hope. I got nowhere else to turn, and I'll turn to you. And in spite of everything we've thrown in God's face and every wrong that we've done, he's there, and he says, I love you. I care about you. I'm here. I want you. That's who our God is. Often we look at these passages not in the light of mercy. We look at the judgment and we see the judgment and it ought to wake us up. But the whole reason why the prophet is there is he's calling his people back. I'm here. I care. And he ends with the last group of people he talks to and he says, priest, fast. Look at verse 13. He says, gird yourselves and lament, you priests, how you ministers of the altar come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. The priests, they better lie all night in sackcloth and ashes. They better get on their face. Man, they can't do their job anymore. They can't lead their people in public worship of God. There seems to be a connection here between the fact that there was no offerings to be made to God because there were no animals, there was no wine, there was none of the ingredients and the things that they needed for the proper sacrifices. And because they weren't available, it seems that there's a connection here that because I can't worship God properly, I'm cut off from God. What could be worse than being cut off from God? Absolutely nothing. Then look what he says in verse 14. He says, sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. The, the children of Israel were only required to fast one day out of a year, but the priests and the spiritual leaders were able to call a fast in times of emergency. This was a time of emergency. And Joel's telling the spiritual leaders, he's saying, get all the people together, get all the inhabitants, the elders, everybody from the land, get them together, get them on their knees, get them on their faces, crying out to God. We have no hope in the earth. We have nowhere else to turn but to God. Do that. Repent. Give your lives to God. And then he says in verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. I'm not going to read the rest of the verses, but he goes on down through verses 16 through 20, and he says, we have no meat. He talks about the joy and gladness from worshiping is gone. The seed is rotten. The storehouses and barns are empty. There is no corn. And then he goes on to say how the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. All creation groans together under the curse of sin. We saw that in Romans. So even the, the beasts are out in the field, and, and they're essentially crying out to God. They're they're moaning and they're, they're in pain and they're in distress and they're crying out to God in, in their own way, in the way that God created them to. And all creation is groaning together, just like it is today. We all groan together under the curse and the weight of sin that hangs over this earth. And you know, all that God wants, all that God wants from all of this is for the people to cry out to him. All that God wants is that we want him. That's it. You want to know the simple answer to this message? Don't go through life without putting God in the driver's seat of your life, without submitting to him, without recognizing his leadership and his control and that he is God and that he loves and that he cares and that he knows best. Man, I heard this illustration the other day and I thought it was so good. A couple weeks ago, I was listening to it and it was talking about the idea of repentance. And it's like this, we're driving down the road, okay? And just imagine as you're driving down the road, you're in your car, and you see Jesus coming your way. And that's a lot like life. Man, we're going through life, and all of a sudden, we get presented with the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is, and we have a decision that needs to be made. And so you pull over the car, and you go to pick up Jesus. But guess what? He doesn't get in the passenger seat. He wants to walk. Jesus walks right over to the driver's side, and he opens up your door, and he says, hey, why don't you get out and let me have this seat, and why don't you get in the passenger seat? And this is the whole idea of repentance. So you do that. You let Jesus get in the driver's seat and you let him take control and you get in the passenger seat. And then all of a sudden, you know what he does? He just turns the car around and goes in the opposite direction. And you're like, but, but I was actually going that way. Like I got somewhere I need to be. And Jesus says, no, <laughs> that way leads nowhere. You've already been going that way and you've been empty. 
It hasn't fulfilled. It hasn't satisfied. You still got questions. Trust me. And that's the whole idea of repentance. You let Jesus take control and he turns your vehicle around and all of a sudden he puts you in a new path and a new direction. And you know what? You can fully trust him and you can fully rely on him because he made you. He knows what you need. He knows how you function. He knows that there's nothing in this world that will satisfy. He knows that only in him can you find what you're looking for. Strength, peace, hope, joy, deliverance. And it doesn't matter what kind of crisis we're faced with or what kind of situation we're in. And here's the last practical application and we're done. Be desperate. Be desperate. Look at verse 19. He says, O Lord, to thee will I cry. That's our answer. O Lord, to thee will I cry. Be desperate. Can I tell you this morning, what's it going to take? What's it going to take? I, I know, and I believe with all my heart, man, there is an angst amongst people. How many of you feel that? Do you feel like there is just like, there is a sense of hopelessness. There's an anger. There's an unrest. There's a discontentment. There's all kinds of different things like that that are happening and taking place in our world today. Do you, do you all feel that? Am I the only one that feels that? I'm not trying just to be just trump up emotions. I just, I talk to people. You turn on the news. People are angry. People are elevated. People are fearful. People are concerned. We're worried. I I talk to you. I talk to other Christians, and we're concerned about what kind of a world our children are going to grow up in, and what kind of world our grandchildren are going to grow up in. There's things that we need to be concerned about, and yet, at the same time, in the midst of all that, I feel like there's a recognition of it, but is there really a desperation for God? You know, I I go back to where we were at with the beginning with all of this. Like, why add a third service? Why give $215,000 to missions? Why start raising money for a new auditorium? And, you know, I feel that this morning, too, because, like, again, yesterday, even, we were out serving the community, and, man, there was literally, there was people up all night. Maybe they slept two hours. There's people showing up at 4 a.m. to set things up, and I talked to a lot of people this morning, and there's a lot of people that are tired. Man, I got up and I ran three miles. That's the first time I've done that in a long time. I'm tired. People are tired here this morning. But we get back up and we come to church and we keep pushing and we keep striving. Why? Because there's a world. You got neighbors. How how many of you know neighbors that are just, they're hurting and they're looking for answers in life? How many of you go to work with somebody like that? You got them, we have them in our family. All of us know people that are searching and that are looking. And you know what? We have the truth and we want people to believe in Jesus and his transforming power. We want people to belong to his church. We want people to become everything that God created them to be. That ought to be our heartbeat and that ought to be our passion. And we know the truth and we know how this is all going to end. The day of the Lord is at hand. Christ could return at any moment. We get it. (laughs) And our hearts ought to be burdened. We ought to be desperate. We ought to be fasting. We ought to be spending a little bit more time in prayer for the people that God's put in our lives and the people that are in our path. Man, we ought to be crying out to God for the people of Pace and Milton, Florida that that are looking for hope when we know who the hope is and we know who the answer is. And if we don't get serious about the truth of God's word, And let it affect our lives to the point where we're willing to do things a little bit differently. We're willing to witness. And we're willing to pray. And we're willing to serve. And we're willing to take the next steps. We're going to miss out. And you know what the truth is? I love this. The day of the Lord's already happened in part. The day of the Lord's already happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross. In part. It began there. That's when the, the punishment and the wrath of God was beginning to be poured out. And his son Jesus took our curse of sin and our penalty and he took it upon himself and he died so that we could have a relationship with him and we live in a special day of mercy and grace and I believe with every fiber of my being if we get desperate and we get hungry and we get praying and we get going and serving and lifting high the name of Jesus look at what's already happening in our church and I know it can continue to happen because God wants to do that work in our lives and so I tell our church Let's be desperate. Let's never lose sight of people. Let's not be numb to the reality and the pain that every moment people are breathing their last breaths. We don't know when life's going to come to an end. Life is a vapor. It appears for a time and vanisheth away. 
We gotta get serious about what we're living for, what our priorities are, why we're here, what we're doing. And let's start by just getting on our face and saying, God, here's my life. You can take it. You have complete control. Where you want me to go, I'll go. How you want me to live, I'll live. I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. I am yours.